The next few moments are devoted to silent prayer. I give to each of you as a believer priest the privacy of your priesthood to rebound if necessary. For if we name our sins, he, God, is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to purify us from all wrongdoing. That means any unknown sin in the life, including as a grace app, as a grace type addition, the evil in our life uh, is forgiven, even though Christ did not die on the cross for evil per se. But if you're a socialist and a believer, and you rebound for one of your sins, well, even the wrongdoing of socialism, and it is a wrongdoing, is forgiven until you have another socialist thought. Then you're right back into wrongdoing. So, you have the next few moments to name your sins to God, so let us pray. Father, we thank you for the wonderful privilege and freedom to assemble ourselves together for the purpose of learning your word. May God the Holy Spirit enlighten us and help us with our concentration in terms of, well, if we don't concentrate, you'll lose the filling of the Spirit. But let us concentrate on this portion of the word of God we ask this in Christ's name. Amen. You don't have to turn to these verses, but uh, I will go over them. Uh, one of them starts at Psalm 119.45. I'm going to turn a light on real quick. 119.45. I will walk about in freedom. For I have sought out your precepts. Now this is Old Testament. This is King David. And he walked about in freedom. Because he knew Bible doctrine. And when it says precepts. It's specific to. He knew Bible doctrine in detail. He didn't get lost in the details. The details added every bit to his meditation on God. The details have added very, very much so to my understanding of freedom. The one thing we do not need to do as in Christendom, especially for those of us who are doctrinal, no doubt about it. Those that are teaching faith alone in Christ alone. No doubt about it. Those that are teaching rebound. No doubt about it. And they're doing a good job. But there's one thing. That they can't get uh, lost on. And, the, and that is the fact that we're, we're going to have to give up that vocabulary. And go back to the old vocabulary. Because the old vocabulary is what made everyone so ignorant of the word. Repent ye. Well, now we know it as rebound and keep moving for the belief for the un, for for the believer. For the unbeliever, repent ye means change your mind about Christ. And so we have details that are important. And the only reason why we would go away from them, and the Word of God is filled with details, look how big that book is. And if you've ever read through Deuteronomy and Leviticus and Numbers, you will see that God is a God of extraordinary detail. 
he even had the endowment of the spirit given to certain people who could build the temple to certain specifications that we could probably not duplicate today because it was done under the power of the spirit and he puts certain details in the Bible for those of us who are positive and I consider those of us who are positive and well first of all one indication is you're always asking a question the preacher says be good you say how and you're not you don't mean to be now there are some people who are being to be snarky but you're not antagonistic toward the word you hear the word be good you really want to know how so you ask the preacher how and he gives you a bunch of gobbledygook about the Mosaic law or some stuff that he's made up in his own mind about what he thinks are the worst sins etc so that's one thing in Christendom for as long as the Lord lets me breathe and gives me enough health to stand behind a pulpit and preach I will use the colonel's vocabulary I will not apologize for it oddly enough uh, they will not let me use on my website his uh, uh, what do you call it where they have the uh, just the examples that you can follow through diagrams that's fine I'm not going to put them on my website I'm going to order them from Baraka Church and pass them out to you <laughs> sometimes I just don't understand but it's none of my business and uh, as far as I'm concerned the colonel gave out the word of God freely somebody else wants to give it out freely then that's fine now somebody's trying to profit off of it well that's still their business they'll be cursed by God so I really don't understand that thinking at all but that's not my place it's not my church used to be my church this is my church <laughs> And I still listen to Colonel Theme and uh, study uh, systematic theology. Lewis Berry Schaefer, a super genius, and I still study under. Uh, I, I'm trying, at least for a while there, with the Greek, and at least looking at some exegesis and looking at some verses and putting them together, and then seeing how the Colonel put them together, and was putting two and two together. But I'm, I'm by no means a Greek student I couldn't write you the Greek alphabet if my life depended on it but I could spout to you quite a bit of the Greek language and uh, I would know what it means I just can't write it you know there there's people who can uh, not read and write but speak pretty well pestuo epiton koreon kai so they say su believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved that's Greek and by the way that is the old way the Greeks would say it the Greeks today would say it differently they would say pistevo but you've heard that if you've listened to the colonel or I could say to you metanoieo e Christas change your mind about Christ or I could say to you poimain didaskolos pastor teacher with the hendiades which means a hyphen but that does not by no means it it does not mean I know Greek but I guarantee you this I know it a lot better than a lot of students who are going through Greek school today simply because I was graced out under the ministry of the greatest pastor since Paul period J. 
Jeremiah 34, 17. Therefore, this is what the Lord says, You've not obeyed me. You have not proclaimed freedom to your own people. So I now proclaim freedom for you, declares the Lord, freedom to fall by the sword, plague, and famine. I will make you abhorrent to all the kingdoms of the earth. That's kind of like our country today. We still talk about freedom because it's part of our culture. It was part of the culture of Israel in Jeremiah's day. It is very, very similar. And we talk about freedom all the time. We don't have freedom. You know who had freedom? Benjamin Franklin had freedom. <laughs> and he used it. He was making fun of politicians. And now get this. He was making fun of clergymen. He was making fun of Puritans. He was making fun of politicians. He was making fun of anyone on two legs that he thought he could make fun of. And he did so because he was a capitalist and said, I can make money off this, plus I'm a genius, and that is how I think of them. as he drank his bourbon a little too much all the way into his old age but that's Benjamin Franklin a super genius I don't know if he was a believer or not I have my doubts not all the founders were believers but that when it comes to human freedom that's for believer and unbeliever and our forefathers both believers and unbelievers came together understanding freedom except for one thing our first what they call national sin slavery we should have never allowed one slave to ever set foot on our shore now we sh we could have let africans come to our shore to enjoy our prosperity but we should have never enslaved them never and I know this because it is a social evil and also because of the book of Philemon. In the book of, and this is dealing with believers especially. A believer should not own another believer. That sounds stupid. And for us it sounds stupid to say I can own another person. But when you take away someone's privacy, you own that person. And that's exactly what's happening in the United States of America today. In a lot of areas where government has gotten too big. So, God says, I'll show you freedom. You always talk about freedom, but you haven't obeyed me. And you have not proclaimed the true freedom to your own people. So now I proclaim you freedom, 28-hour work week, food stamps, unemployment check, eventual destitution. And that's part of the third cycle of discipline. Jeremiah here was talking about the fact that uh, not only would there be famine, but they would go under the fourth and then finally the fifth cycle of discipline and we're heading in the same direction at, at a rapid rate and you might look at me and say I've heard this all my life I think we might can make it you might be right I'm not a prophet and I hope we can make it but the only way we are going to make it is because of you and you and me and whoever else gets evangelized and gets with the word of God and I think the only reason this nation right now is on life support as a client nation is because God is either just giving us that one last gasp of breath of grace to say look I tried to give it to you. I had voices crying out in the wilderness, but you would not listen. Or there might be a generation that responds 
It's going to be one or the other. As Ronald Reagan said, from the human standard of freedom, freedom can be taken away in one generation. The attitudes of one generation of people can destroy all of the progress of freedom beforehand. It's happened. Ronald Reagan warned of the very things Jeremiah warned of about freedom. You see, they had the same type thing going on at that time. It was ancient times, but and they had different terminology, but uh, Ronald Reagan came along and said, hey, you think you're going to have freedom by going under socialized health care because you won't have to pay for your doctor? And he said this in the 1960s. And he, says if, and he said then, if this nation ever adopts nationalized health care, we cease being a free country. We are there. It starts next year. Now it seems to be falling apart a little. So there may be hope. Jesus Christ controls history. Now I know we can we pick political fun and, and we do that kind of stuff and we talk about politics and I do it too. And there's nothing wrong with that. It's part of our culture. Uh, but as far as the, the word of God is concerned, all of that symptom shadow boxing. There used to be a man in Spartanburg, South Carolina who was psychotic as could be and he would walk down the street and throw some vicious punches. I saw him. Problem was there wasn't anybody on the other end, the receiving end. He thought there was, but there wasn't. And he was working himself up into a sweat, cussing the guy out. For all I know, he thought he was whooping up on Mike Tyson, who was the big guy of that day. He probably thought he was, or whooping up on somebody that made him mad, or just just out crazy whooping up on everybody, zombies. Nowadays, it would be zombies, I guess. But the point is, he's slinging his arms around and cussing and yelling. And that could happen in this country. Some people ask, why don't the people uprise? I've even asked it myself. Why aren't the people a little bit more upset about it? You want to know something? Even if they did get upset about the political end of the things that are going on, all they would be doing is boxing at the air. The real problem is in the soul, in the spiritual life of the believer. The unbeliever is not the problem in this country. The believer is. Because we have the biggest collection of baby believers I've ever seen. I mean, it's gotten worse. There was a time I could go around and have a normal conversation with some people about Bible doctrine and use the colonel's terminology and not be looked at like a freak or not be... Uh, I don't know, trained on how to do something differently because we can't all be like the colonel now, can we? No, we can't, but we can all use his vocabulary. Now, can we not? I remember a time when we all did. I did. When I went to the conference, everybody, most everybody there did who knew the language. The pivot was larger, much larger. Now people have gone off into goofy land. And if you don't say something a certain way, and if you have a crass type language, which just means common English, and if you know how to tell a good joke in writing anyway, then uh, they just, they're just going to go ballistic. They're not going to. They're just going to go all legalistic. We're headed straight back toward legalism. And I wanted to teach some, 
I wanted to teach legal, legalism. I have to. It's in the Bible. But I wanted to get to some other things. But these people have gone back to the milk. Maybe there are some out there who who will get it. A new generation. So I'll keep plugging on. 2 Corinthians 3.17 now the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. Galatians 2.4 This matter arose between because some false believers had infiltrated our ranks to spy on the freedom we have in Christ Jesus and to make us slaves. That's legalism, trying to stick their long proboscis, their nose, into uh, someone else's business, pry into their privacy, and spy on their freedom. And tell them they're not doing this right, and that right, and the other right. But Galatians 5.1 says, It is for freedom that Christ has set us free. Stand firm. And do not let yourselves be burdened again by a yoke of slavery. That yoke of slavery in Galatians is specifically referring to legalism. But you can also go back to the yoke of slavery of antinomianism. That's taught in Corinthians. If you don't know what I'm talking about, you'll have to go back and listen to the essentials. It's all there for you. <clears throat> well, we, uh, the other night we watched a show. I got, I'm going to close it up earlier than usual, and then get it, continue tomorrow night if I feel like it. But uh, the show we watched last night, uh, I believe, was or the night before, was about an, a man named. Caligulus. He lived during around 36 A.D. This man was emperor of Rome. He was an unbeliever, of course. But he had, uh, this man did some things that uh, would even shock American culture. I mean, the Romans always did things that would shock our culture. I mean, we always look at our country and say, yeah, we're really going downhill because of our moral values have slipped and all of that. Those are symptoms. But this never was a Brady Bunch society. That was just an illusion. That was something that we were told as something to aspire to. Now we're told to aspire down. We used to be told to aspire up to these moral values. That protect freedom. Now we are told to aspire down to squalor and filth. Well, the Romans to us would have been a very filthy people. But do you know they became the greatest client nation in all of human history and there's going to be something else that's going to shock you. And I, I, sometimes I just have to bring this out because legalism, because of background, and of everyone of most people the background of most believers I'm not trying to preach at you I'm trying to keep you all objective it, even I have a tendency sometimes not lately but even I have a tendency to start thinking in terms of this is right that is wrong this is moral that is immoral blam 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 and all of that may be true. But let me uh, tell you about Caligula. I'm sorry I'm going so slow. I'm just trying to put my thoughts together. Caligula had sex with all three of his sisters. He had sex with his uncle. His uncle murdered all of Caligula's family. Caligula, Caligula, Himself, the emperor of Rome around 36 AD. And this was during Paul's life, but Paul did, was not yet dead. And uh, 
th around 36 AD, the Lord had already departed and uh, to be with God, the Father, at the right hand. But Caligula uh, murdered his own father. Actually, what he did was his father was on his dying bed and he was breathing heavily. One of the signs, there are several signs of death. But one of the signs is, uh, some of them are totally opposite, but one of the signs is labored breathing. Well, he was in labored breathing, and I've seen it before. It's, it's very odd. It's like they're gasping for air, but they're comatose. They don't know they're gasping for air. Well, that's the way old Caligula's old man had gotten. So he just went up, pulled the ring off his finger, and he, he hadn't even breathed his last yet. But then Caligula said, I am the emperor. The whole country went wild. And then uh, about 24 hours later, the old man got up and was feeling better and said, uh, could you bring me some food? Instead, they brought him a pillow and smothered him to death. Now, he's about to die anyway because a lot of people feel better right before they die. I learned that in hospice. But it doesn't happen to everyone, but it's just something, a phenomenon that doctors and nurses know about. So, just think about Caligula and that evil having sex with all three of his sisters and his uncle. And he was a pedophile. He had sex with children. He had his whole ring of little boys and little girls to fondle. Lots of them. But guess who is the worst of all sinners? Not Caligulus. Saul of Tarsus, who later became the Apostle Paul. And how do we know? Because God, the Holy Spirit, through the very words of the Apostle Paul, tells us in 1 Timothy 1.15, Here is a trustworthy saying that deserves full acceptance. In other words, I'm telling you the truth. <laughs> this is not a lie, and you better accept it. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am the worst. God told him that as an unbeliever, he was the worst of all sinners, of all human history. And he would have never thought of having sex with his sister, and he would have never thought of mur uh, murdering at least not his own family. He would have never thought of breaking one jot or tittle of the Mosaic Law or all the other thousands of human additions. In fact, he was the greatest of all Pharisees. People today would worship him as Pope, as Saul of Tarsus. As the Apostle Paul, he died with one man at his burial site. As Saul of Tarsus, he was the man revered as the Pope is revered. And yet, he was the worst of all sinners. Wrap your mind around that. And once you wrap, wrap your mind around that, start thinking about your own life. Start thinking about how you evaluate others. Stop thinking about how others do this and that that may be antinomian in nature and wrong and sinful and destructive. And they're very overt, so it's very easy to talk about. But I have very rarely hear, until usually, until lately, <laughs> about legalists. And I, I only say until lately. 
not among Christendom. But uh, I rarely hear. They all want to act holy. You can't say one word out of place, and if you do, well, you are human refuse. Bye-bye. And yet they walk around in self-righteousness, and they're, well, best way I could put it, and then I'll close. My cousin decided he found a really neat mud hole. And he had his first or second motorcycle. And him and his friends went out through there. And they tore that place up. And they had a blast. They were tearing up the Spartanburg sewer uh, system le let off. And they came home covered in that stuff and they could not smell themselves. That's a legalist. They are covered in dung or Spartanburg sewer system crap, however you want to put it. And they can't smell themselves. And yet they're so ready to take their finger that has got that little dung under their nail and they want to stick it in your eye and pluck out the little, the little, the little uh, toothpick out of your eye with their crappy little finger. You wonder why I get irritated sometimes? I mean, I don't, people say, don't make it about me, but I'm just trying to make you relate to how I'm thinking in terms of the spiritual life. I'm not thinking in terms of I want to be antagonistic. I'm thinking of terms of a piece of crap finger coming into my eyeball and trying to prick out a little bitty tiny piece of uh, what we could call it a toothpick compared to the fact that they have a log in their eye covered in dung. That's a legalist for you. And what's a legalist? Well, we could all get into it. Any of us who get, in, get into judging and maligning and gossiping and ripping somebody else down because their sins are differently than our sins, because we don't sin the same way they sin, because their sins are out in the open and everybody's going to know about it and make fun of them. Well, nobody would make fun of us. We're too respectable, aren't we? Yes, we are. Well, aren't we great? No. You're running around the Spartanburg sewer system on your motorcycles with a big fat you know what? Eating grin on your face. So with your heads bowed and your eyes closed, Father, we thank you for the wonderful privilege and opportunity of studying these things. May God the Holy Spirit challenge us by what we've studied. In Christ's name we ask it. Amen.